Here at the Asian Art Museum, we have one of the most interesting models of what's known as a stupa or a monumental reliquary in the United States. What you're looking at right here is that specific replica, and it's a replica of a temple called the Svayambhunath Temple in Kathmandu in Nepal. Now, Svayambhunath means the Lord who is self-arisen, in other words, who has created itself. So, this monument is understood to be self-created, but in a very special kind of way. Let me describe that to you by talking about some of the features of this very object. First of all, one of the things that may strike you about this stupa is that it has a very strange form. Look how the center of the stupa has steps that go inwards and then come back outwards at each of the four cardinal points. Whenever you see this shape, you're looking at a structure called Mount Meru. Mount Meru is understood to be the central point in the Buddhist cosmos and the Hindu cosmos as well. Uh, it, you might compare it to the Mount Olympus of the Indian and Tibetan traditions. So whenever you see that form, you know that it's at the center of the cosmos. Now, what do you suppose is on top of that center of the cosmos mountain? Well, if you take a look at this scalloped formation just on top of the surface there, what you'll see is a double lotus. A bunch of lotus leaves on the bottom and a bunch of lotus leaves on the top. Now, whenever you see that form, the lotus is like a hieroglyph for something that's self-generated. Think about it. Whenever you see a lotus on a pond, you can't see its stalk, you can't see its seed. All you see is that blossom coming up. So in Indo-Tibetan thought, whenever you see that lotus, it's a hieroglyph for something that is self-generated. Now in the present context, you're saying, what? Something like a stupa could be self-generated because as it turns out, a stupa is in fact a building. It's a monumental reliquary. It's an edifice in which the remains of deceased meditators are often placed. So the thing here that's self-generated is that hemispherical structure, that dome-like structure, on top of those two lotuses. That's what's spontaneously manifested. And that is the most important part of the stupa. Now, when you take a look at that top structure, you're going to see that it's got four different sides to it. And on each one of those four different sides, you're going to find a Buddha who's in a different sort of, who has a different sort of hand position. So, on the eastern side of this stupa, you'll find a Buddha who's touching the earth. On the western side of the stupa, you'll find a Buddha who's meditating. On the northern side of the stupa, you'll find a Buddha who's saying, don't fear. On the southern side, one who's giving you a gift. And then at the very center, you'll see a Buddha who's teaching. However, if you look at this stupa very closely, you'll notice quickly that it is impossible to see the center of the stupa. So where is this particular Buddha? If you look very closely, and that's really the key here, if you look closely at the stupa, you're going to find this central Buddha on that cubic structure right there. Now I say you may find that central Buddha, but my suspicion is that he'll find you first. Look very closely and see what you see on that cubic structure there on top of the dome. What you'll see is two eyes looking back at you from all four sides. This is the Buddha Vairochana at the center of the cosmos. Sometimes in Sanskrit he's called Sarvavid, which means all-seeing. And you can understand why he would be, because he's at the center of the cosmos and looks out in all directions. Now, above that cubic structure, you'll see a tower that ascends up to the top levels of form, the form worlds and the formless worlds, up into emptiness. At the bottom underneath, you'll see the four sides of the continents that comprise uh, the world that we live in. They're understood to be four sides to this continent. And on each one of those sides, you'll find a guardian figure who is responsible for preventing any kind of negative forces from affecting what's going on right here. Now we talked a moment ago about how this structure is understood to be self-generated. So what story do the Nepalese tell about how this stupa was self-generated? As it turns out, in the collection of the Asian Art Museum, we have a wonderful Tonka painting that depicts how this took place. Now to make a very long story very short, 
What happened was that a bajillion years ago, way in the past, an ancient Buddha planted a seed in the Kathmandu Valley, which at that time was a lake. That seed grew into a, guess what, into a lotus, a spontaneously generated lotus. And on top of that lotus, there grew the monument that you see right here. And into that monument came five different colored rays of light, one for each of the five Buddhas. And today, the Nepalese understand those Buddhas as still residing within this stupa. They never went anywhere. They're still there. Now, there's one catch. In order to keep the power of those five Buddhas in this particular monument, the monument must be renovated periodically. And this is done in a specific way and in quite a dangerous way as well. The object that you're looking at right here has been gilded, that is coated with gold, through a process known as mercury gilding. It's very dangerous and produces mercury vapors. Uh, interestingly enough, three years ago in Kathmandu, the monument itself was renovated using the same process and, get this, 20 kilograms of gold. So, to renovate one of these monuments, to turn it back into its new condition, is no small undertaking. But when you think about the idea that this is the center of the cosmos and the beginning of the process that leads to enlightenment, then perhaps it makes a good deal of sense to spare no expense.